Okay, I think we'll slowly get started as more people trickle in. Um, but good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's lovely to see to see you here today with us. My name is Elspeth Chapman, uh, and I am a strategic partnership and advocacy specialist with the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. So welcome to our webinar today, Strategic and Advocacy and Funding in Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, Leveraging Data and Evidence for Success. This is a joint collaboration uh, by two of the working groups of the Alliance. So the Assessments, Measurements and Evidence and the Advocacy Working Group. Before we get started, I wanted to share some housekeeping information. So we do have interpretation available in French, Spanish and Arabic for this webinar. So if you need to use interpretation, please find the globe icon in your Zoom panel at the bottom right hand side of your screen. And you may also need to click on the three dots, which say more, to find the interpretation option. We also invite you to introduce yourself in the chat and please do use the Q&A function to ask questions in real time throughout the, throughout the webinar. We will ensure that you will get a response to your questions either during or after the event. Um, so just to provide some very brief framing, this webinar comes at a really crucial moment. As you all know, humanitarian needs are soaring to unprecedented levels and children are really bearing the brunt of these crises. They face heightened violence, exploitation, abuse and neglect, and miss record levels of armed conflict, disasters associated with natural hazard, and climate-induced disasters. We know that prioritizing child protection and humanitarian response is essential, yet the stark reality is that it often falls short. As many of you know, last week, along with our partners, the Child Protection Area of Responsibility, UNHCR and Save the Children, we launched our annual uh, funding report, The Unprotected. So this analyzes child protection funding across UN coordinated appeals. So this fifth report in a series tracked child protection and humanitarian funding in 2023. The report shows that despite historically high levels of funding, the funding rate for UN coordinated appeals was only 43%, a record low. Furthermore, only 30% of requested child protection funding was received across these appeals. So this means that child protection is disproportionately funded despite children being the most severely impacted by crises. In addition, if you delve into the report, and we obviously encourage you to do so, you can see there are significant disparities in child protection funding across humanitarian and refugee contexts. So this severely hampers the ability of child protection actors to provide quality, consistent programs for children, their families and communities. The recommendations from this report, and this is sort of the, the, the sounding board we want to spring from for this webinar today, highlights the critical role we all play, child protection and humanitarian practitioners, donors, policymakers and humanitarian leaders to ensure child protection is prioritized across the humanitarian response. This means prioritizing child protection as a standalone sector and also as a critical element integrated across all humanitarian sectors. In order to do this, we need to ensure we are systematically levering, leveraging data and, advocacy and evidence as part of our advocacy efforts to make the case for investments in child protection. For us, this webinar is a critical step in our joint learning, and we really look forward to continuing this collaboration between our advocacy and our assessments, measurements, and evaluation working groups to better support child protection in, a, in a humanitarian action advocacy efforts moving ahead. So thank you so much for being here today, and I will now hand over to my colleague, Stephanie Acker, co-lead of the AME working group to take us through the agenda. Thanks, Elspeth, and thank you all for joining us. Um, so we know that funding for child protection is lacking, um, but we and we know that evidence has a role to play, but what is the best way to do that? And so this webinar is going to look at how evidence and data can be leveraged to improve policy and funding advocacy. 
what are the examples from other sectors of how this has happened? What is happening in CPHA? Is there sufficient evidence and data or do we need more evidence and data? And what can we um, in the child protection and humanitarian action community do to more successfully both generate new evidence and use what we have to successfully advocate? Before we go any further, um, it is so important to us in the Alliance to know who and how we are connecting with um, individuals across the field. So we're going to do a quick mentee poll because we'd like to hear from you. And so um, on the screen shortly, we'll pull get out one's browser. Um, it's a chat, click on this link, and we're gonna have a few questions with your opinion. All right, I'm just giving everyone a moment to join. If you see um, in the chat, there is the link. And um, you could also just go to menti.com and use this code 6382337. So our first question as you're joining um, the Menti poll, we want to know, in your opinion, how important do you think evidence and data are in advocacy efforts? One being zero being not important at all to five being extremely important. So on the scale, select how important you think evidence and data are in advocacy. We're seeing some votes come in, we'll keep going. Seems like most people are thinking it's pretty important. Give everyone one more minute to vote if you haven't yet. Okay, we're going with it as 4.6, very important, um, according to everyone who's here today. Uh, so let's go to the next question now. And we are putting the interpretation of the questions into the chat if you'd like to um, see better what they're asking. So. In this question, we'd like to know, in your opinion, which of these humanitarian sectors does the best job of leveraging data and evidence for successful advocacy? Um, is it food security, livelihoods, education, health, nutrition, WASH, shelter and settlement, camp management, or child protection? Which of these do you think is doing the best at using data and evidence? Okay, we'll give everyone one more minute to cast their vote. If you don't know, you can take your best guess. Health has a strong lead. Okay, we'll call it there and um, it'll be interesting to know what we can learn from the health and food security sectors if um, common opinion is that they are using evidence and data. Um, better than maybe other sectors or more effectively. So we'll switch back now. I am delighted to introduce our panelists today. Um, I'm going to take and give different examples of, they, examples of evidence and data used for successful advocacy. Uh, so each of our panelists is going to um, share their um, uh, share an example and why they thought that was successful. So in this order, we're going to hear from Ashley Howard, who is a violence epidemiologist at Together for Girls. Les Roberts will follow, who is a professor emeritus at Columbia University. Um, and then Maria Vargas Samoji will um, conclude. She is a protection, gender, and education and emergencies expert at ECHO. Um, Rabia Subram Subramanian is the chief research on gender rights and protection at the UNICEF and Achenti of Global Office of Research and Foresight. She will serve as our discussant and moderator. Um, next slide, please. So each of our panelists is going to share when they have seen data and evidence used to advocate for funding or policy change successfully. 
What did happen in the example? What did they do or the study do? What change did it lead to? And what were some of the ingredients of success? After they present, uh, Ramia is going to provide some reflections and then lead us in a roundtable discussion to connect how we can use this information to advance advocacy and child protection. If you have questions you can um, for the panelists, please put them into the chat. We will have some time at the end. Um, so you can put them into the Q&A function or the chat in whatever language best suits you. Uh, so I'll now hand it over to Ashley to kick off our panel. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Ashley Howard. I am a violence researcher with Together for Girls. I've been involved in the Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys for a number of years, as well as with the development of the data to action model for the VAX um, and with the development of guidelines for humanitarian VAX implementation. Next slide, please. Together for Girls is a global partnership working to end violence against children and youth, especially sexual violence against girls. Next slide. Our model includes working with uh, partners to implement the Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys. These have been conducted in 25 countries, including two countries that have done Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys in humanitarian settings, that is in refugee camps, uh, and three studies, uh, four now, that have done repeat Violence Against Children and Youth Studies. Next slide. Our leadership council and partners include donors, multilateral organizations, uh, NGOs that uh, are committed to using the Violence Against Children data. Next slide, please. And our model is essentially to use data collected during implementation of the Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys to advocate for and drive collective programmatic and policy changes that are true actions that will ensure prevention of violence against children and youth and ensure healing and justice for victims and survivors. Next slide. The Violence Against, uh, against Children and Youth Surveys are nationally representative household surveys that are led by national governments. More on that in a few moments. Uh, we conduct, uh, these surveys are conducted by national governments and local implementing partners with technical support from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as Together for Girls Partners, these surveys provide capacity building to local organizations to interview 13 to 24-year-old children and youth on their experiences of sexual, emotional, and physical violence prior to age 18, as well as outcomes of violence, protective and risk factors for violence, knowledge of services, um, tendencies to disclose uh, and use services as well. And to date, the Violence Against Children and Youth Surveys, I'll refer to them now as the VAX, have been conducted in uh, 25 countries and provide data on more than 12% of the world's children. Next. One of the most important elements of success for the VAX and our data to action model is leadership of a multi-sectoral coordination mechanism by local national governments, implementation by governments from day one, and leadership by governments is absolutely critical to ensure that they feel ownership over the data, that they are involved in the process of adaptation, implementation, development of additional modules due to, for issues that are important to government and country to inform upcoming policies and programs, um, and to ensure that they are committed to using those data later on for policy and programmatic action. Next, please. Uh, and you can skip the next slide. So our model is to collect data and then host data to action workshops in country with local governments in which government organizes stakeholders to prioritize actionable findings and commit to using those findings in, a, in implementing evidence-based and evidence-informed policies and programs that will prevent and respond to violence against children. Through our data to action model, we use the INSPIRE framework, um, which is a framework of seven strategies for ending violence against children, including through evidence-based um, uh, evidence based programming to implement and enforce laws, change norms and values, provide safe environments, provide parent and safe and caregiver support services, provide other response and support services, and improve education and life skills. Next. A a couple of years ago, USAID commissioned a study called The Power of Data to Action. This has been published um, and looked at 
what the results of the vaccinated action process have been in interviewing um, stakeholders across 20 countries that have implemented the VAX, they found that 95% of stakeholders, 75 feel that they have that the VAX data have been very useful. 75% say that the VAX data have been very useful. 5% they've been somewhat useful. And only 5% say that they've been a little useful or not very useful. So 95% feel that the VAX data have been very or uh, somewhat useful. 75% very useful in um, making change in country. 13 of those countries have improved child safety laws or regulations. Five have implemented VAX indicators in their national statistics. 10 have banned corporal punishment. Five have launched new initiatives to keep girls safe. And nine have banned child marriage. Next. Next, please. I'd like to give you an example of uh, the like one country in particular, Kenya, between 20. 10 when they initially uh, conducted a VAX in 2019 when the repeat VAX was conducted, we see some really spectacular results. Next. From 2010 to 2019, we see more than two thirds reduction in the prevalence of sexual violence against boys in Kenya. For girls, sexual violence was reduced by more than half between 2010 and 2019. Next slide, and we'll talk about what actions have actually driven the, those changes. So. Between 2010 and 2019, uh, Together for Girls commissioned a study, a decade of change, um, looking at what actually happened and what may have driven those massive reductions, two thirds for boys, 50% for girls um, in reductions in violence against children and saw some major changes in strengthening legal and policy frameworks, especially increased funding for services, increased awareness, increased participation of children uh, and many different programmatic actions as well that we can speak to. Next slide. Um, however, the Kenya government wasn't satisfied. They saw 50%, 75%, uh, sorry, 60% and 50% uh, reductions in sexual violence against children. Um, they could have said, okay, uh, we're finished. We've made a great impact here, but they still saw in the latest data that there were major issues. For example, only one in three females, one in four um, males who had experienced sexual violence in childhood knew where to go for help. And even fewer, one in eight girls and three in, ten, three in 100 boys sought help for um, sexual violence experiences in childhood. So the government conducted their data to action workshop again, committed in many different areas, but I'm focusing just on this one area, committed to five approaches to address service access specifically, and then identified 25 specific actions to implement to um, to implement those five approaches to improve service access based on this uh, very clear uh, data gap. Um, that is that is the the what I wanted to share with you in this short amount of time. Um, I hope this provides uh, a little bit of um, food for thought for the discussion. Next slide, and, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, hello. My name is Les Roberts. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I was the director of policy at the International Rescue Committee, and uh, I spent 20 years at Columbia University after that. So here's a little girl that I met in 1999 in Eastern Congo when we were doing a mortality survey. <clears throat> and you can't tell, but she's really dehydrated when you grab her skin and and, and pull it out, it, it doesn't bounce back. To make a long story short, I convinced her father that he should take her to the clinic. When we walked by this girl's house like six hours later, the father hadn't gone and I had given him money to pay for the clinic. And he said, I didn't know, but my local clinic is closed because of the, the violence and fighting. So we gave him a ride to the hospital. It turns out this girl's mother had died a few months earlier. Turns out, because the economy had collapsed, he hadn't been to a market in months. And like this really highlights the indirect collateral of conflict in the poorest settings. And was she going to die because her mother died? Yeah, probably. Was she on the road to death because her father didn't have any money? Yes. Was it because the local clinic died? And we've got this weird thing that happens that people talk about deaths from war as if it's one thing. When in Bosnia and Iraq, most deaths, most excess deaths are from violence. And the most 
the highest mortality any country has ever has measured in the last 30 years was measured by a Congolese NGO two years ago in the Central African Republic. And only 5% of the deaths were from violence. And uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so we did this survey. It, it triggered a, an outbreak to a measles. Uh, oh, could we go back one, please? To a, a measles outbreak, we, we had a good response that made IRC very happy. So the year after, in 2000 and then in 2001, we went out to places that we thought were safe enough to do a survey for a whole health zone. Some of them were as small as 60,000, some were as large as 300,000. And so we did it in six places in 2000, six places in 2001. <clears throat> and then scientifically, we did a sort of lame thing. We said, well, you know, if Labunga in Oriental province had a death rate of this, we could probably conservatively assume that probably all of Oriental province had that death rate. Because remember, we went to the safest places where we thought we could do this without dying. And uh, <clears throat> we found a really high death rate everywhere we went. Next slide, please. And what's really interesting is that the International Rescue Committee negotiated with the New York Times to get this on the front page if we gave them an exclusive scoop. I didn't know you could negotiate with the New York Times. And it got a lot of press coverage. Interestingly, at that time in 2000, the US government was very pro Rwanda and did not like these results and did not want to be criticizing Rwanda, mostly because of guilt for our lack of action during the Rwandan genocide. And it's interesting when you have mortality data, unlike much of the data we collect in the humanitarian endeavor, there are these internal tools for arguing when people don't believe your data. Next slide, please. So for example, lots of people said, this is just, Mobutu had a collapsed country. Now he's gone. They're still poor and dysfunctional. And here is the profile from the from five places in the first outing in 2000. And it turns out that in growing populations, you'll always have more children who are less than one or one than you will children who are two and three. But it always should be a downward trend as you look at the age of, of children by year. And lo and behold, in Eastern Congo, everywhere we went in 2000 and 2001, there were fewer little kids than there were three and four year olds. That means this is not just Mobutu's dysfunction continuing. Something is really different because little kids are the most susceptible to death in times of hardship by a lot. And therefore this lack of little kids is implying something is really different and more stressful now than five years ago. Likewise, we had a lot of people saying, oh, the Congolese, they hate Rwandans and they're just lying. Can we go to the next slide, please? Built into this data was the fact that in the areas with the highest mortality, we saw the smallest fraction of the population in the last column on the right under five. What's most sort of interesting is if we look at the three surveys in Katana, we did the exact same th survey three years in a row with the same questionnaire. And lo and behold, every year, the fraction of children under five got smaller. This is, this is what we have in our data from people telling us who's alive in their household. No way could people be so sophisticated as to lie and suggest that no, 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 their children aren't dying. Next slide, please. So this mortality data was really powerful. In 2000, we estimated 1.7 million had died. Interestingly, within a couple of weeks, the UN passed a resolution saying that all the warring parties needed to withdraw from Eastern Congo. US government funding went up by more than tenfold come the new budget year, October 1st, that followed a few months later. European Union funding went up by several fold as well. <clears throat> we repeated this process in 2001, as I mentioned, 
By then, we thought the death toll was two and a half million. Interestingly, the Washington Post, wanting to compete with the New York Times, sent someone out to accompany me. It ran on the front page of the Washington Post. It got even more press coverage than last time. But also, interestingly, for our story, IRC and the NGO's goal and MSF were all measuring that when they provided health service services in an area, the death toll would go down. And all three were estimating, you know, for every $200 we spend, for every $400 we spend, we're averting a death. Wow, did the donors love that. They were coming to IRC and wanting to give them more money because this was just so appealing when dealing with Congress and other sort of funders above them to be able to say that they were that successful. Unfortunately, then the 9-11 attacks happened in 2001 and this got sort of this trend ended. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so since like, 30 years ago, when measuring mortality was sort of the definition of a humanitarian crisis, several things have happened to make the measuring of mortality by NGOs less common and less of a priority. The main thing I think that happened was rights-based programming. We can talk about that more. There are fewer high mortality events. This graphic on the right shows the highest death toll for any couple years from the 1970s up through Myanmar in 2017. And, you know, there used to be a lot of places where 1% uh, of the population would die per month. We rarely see that in the last 20 years. There used to be quite firm political separation between humanitarian spending in many countries and government forces. That really has eroded. Mortality measures have become way more political. Twice in the last couple of years, MSF has sort of started doing mortality surveys and stopped because they didn't want to, or in the end, in the case of Tigray, didn't release it because they didn't want the gut to upset the host government. And in general, I think NGOs and donors have become a little more risk adverse. So asking to measure mortality in violent places is harder. Next, please. But on That's the other one hand- One more minute. On the other hand, several things have happened that make measuring the tangible, the most tangible outcome of mortality a higher priority. The humanitarian summit in Istanbul, the U.S. and U.S. governments actually have NGO promotion uh, programs going on to promote such collection. There is enormous donor fatigue with child protection and mental health programs that don't have coherent outcomes that are tangible. We can talk about that more. And I think there's an appreciation of how biased the internet is. We'll, we'll skip that and can we go to the next slide, please? So in summary, wow, was this wildly successful? Probably 10 other times I did this when I was with IRC, measuring mortality and having funding go up. Not every time, but a lot of times. And that has declined for 20 years, but is on the upswing again. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I, I have less somehow stuck in my screen, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> uh, my name is Maria Vargas. I am the Regional Protection, Gender and Education's uh, thematic advisor with DG Echo. Um, I super interesting Ashley has talked about. Um, I, I read <laughs> the abstractions part that came at the end, and um, I think it it it's it's a good seg into what I'm going to talk about a little bit more now. I'm I did not uh, answer the question exactly how it was asked of me, <laughs> so bear with me. <laughs> um, I think I want to be a little bit provocative in the sense, um, kind of going back to what Les was talking about, these issues of the data that we already have, the, 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 the big amount of data that has already been collected and the kind of demonstrable impact that we have had with, with certain data collection and what we have been able to do. I would challenge um, child protection actors to the fact that 
we have normally our constituencies, uh, the people that we, we, we are here to serve are 50% children. Um, so that's the get go, right? In the majority of humanitarian crisis, the majority of the 50% of the people that we're here to serve are children which ha who have specific vulnerabilities. We don't need to discuss their vulnerabilities. We know what child vulnerabilities are. Um, there is nutrition issues like Les was talking about, which are very clear and have been documented over decades. Then we have also child protection issues, we have, which have been there and are there in every single crisis, whether it's a conflict, whether it's a slower onset, whether it's a disaster. So the numbers of unaccompanied children, the numbers of separated children, all of that, we always have an indication that that is going to happen. Um, and so if we counteract this, the fact that we have decades long data from different conflicts, from different disasters, and the fact that specific needs assessments require a lot of time, I want to kind of, my, my <laughs> advocacy piece towards you, and I think it's up for discussion, is the fact of why are we conducting an its assessment for every single crisis? We have had, uh, <laughs> yeah, we know the data, right? It's there, <laughs> Les is laughing, but we have data that these things are going to happen. So if we look at different parts of the community, of our humanitarian community, if we look at GBV, right? It took decades to get there, but we have finally gotten to the point where we do not have to get, have data to assume that GBV is taking place, right? The, the assumption with GBV is GBV takes place in all humanitarian settings. We program, program, program. And through programming, then we collect data, we tailor, we do assessments. But the important thing is to provide the service and not to spend three to six months gathering everyone together to do a joint needs assessment and then find out that we have 2% of unaccompanied or separated children, which we already knew we had beforehand. And what have those children been doing for the last three to six months? So th this is my advocacy to you. I know it's a bit controversial. Um, I think this is where it would be interesting to see how the Alliance and other sort of, let's say, data-focused organizations could help the child protection community to, to work on this sort of um, uh, evidence that we do not need to prove every single time. We do not need to have an assessment that tells me that we have... Uh, 30 unaccompanied children. What I want to see as a donor is that there is a service being provided to that child. And as you continue to gather data for other children that might not have been caught in the beginning. We have been hearing as a donor community a lot about the no regrets approach. This has been the UN buzzword for the last couple of years. No regrets approach to huge infrastructure developments, right? No regrets approach to the Ethiopian crisis. Let's build reception centers in Somalia, let's build reception centers in Djibouti, so we're ready when the people come. The whole concept of no regrets is we do not regret an investment even if the crisis does not happen, right? We have not had a no regrets approach in regards to the softer parts, the services parts of the investment. We've only focused on no regrets on infrastructure. And while I understand that, of course, there is a very big life-saving component to having toilets and a health clinic set up if you're expecting an influx, I think COVID taught us that child protection frontline services are as life-saving. So we also need to have that no regrets approach in that service provision. We start programming and through that programming, we gather data, we gather the further information, and then we can redirect our programming. We, I'm not talking, you know, programming for years. I'm talking three to six months. So I'm, I'm humanitarian donor, right? So we operate in very short timelines. So I think this is particularly important. I mean, this is my, my pitch. Let's, let's start doing and through doing, we can also gather the, the information. And then the other, the other part, and I think this would be interesting also to understand a little bit from the other two panelists, uh, um, how, how they would recommend this, how we train the donor community to actually understand child protection. Because I focus on child protection on a daily basis, right? I'm a protection expert. <laughs> this is my background. This is also my emphasis. This is what I do on a daily basis. But my colleagues are not. My colleagues are going through with competing priorities, looking at, like the mentee showed, the health, the food, the wash, and why is child protection not part of this reflex? 
Why are we not considering child protection as an inherent part of an initial response that needs to happen? And I think this is the work where the kind of, I, I, I don't want to call it forensic data, but perhaps we need to consider that, how this decade long data, we, we can start doing advocacy with that on a constant basis that does not necessarily have to wait for the crisis to come because we need to do both things in parallel, right? We need to kind of build this reflex to understand child protection as more than just this very specialized service provision. But at the same time, we need to also be able to provide services when the crisis comes. And I don't know if that's my time, but I think I'll stop there. <laughs> and uh, we, I'm happy to have a discussion on this. And please feel free to challenge me <laughs> in my little bit controversial approach. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Ramya and I'm going to be moderating the next 20, 25 minutes of this conversation. So thank you so much to all the three speakers and also, of course, to the Alliance for facilitating this, this webinar, because we've really had a chance not just to hear about initiatives in child protection, research initiatives in child protection, um, which, you know, maybe as, as the Mentimeter showed, we may not be aware actually of how much data and evidence there is. And for some reason, we're not able to translate that knowledge into people's uh, sort of familiarity perhaps with data and evidence. And there's a gap there. So our community perceives that there isn't much being done, but clearly there is there is work being done. So we're very glad to hear about a couple of these examples in particular, but hopefully we can continue to look for more examples and bring them to light. So that was one uh, one point I wanted to make. And I think secondly, you know, what I really liked and hopefully we can get into it more is that, you know, we are talking today here about what we can do better in that data and evidence universe, not just to say, oh, here's all the evidence and data, but how do we improve, and I think Maria, you alluded to it, how do we improve our tactics and strategies uh, to really prioritize better, to influence change better? And here we have two case studies which perhaps are taking us towards really reflecting and thinking about the lessons we are learning, you know, because one of the things I will say just in terms of working at a research institute, uh, including on child protection issues is, it actually takes up a lot of our time. You know, the design of the, the research initiatives is not just about the best methodology. Of course, that's critical, but it's also about bringing the right actors together, making sure your questions are relevant, co consulting widely, you know, then also going back during the research and after. But somehow, maybe we are not able to make that whole process explicit and transparent to show that research is really actually a co-created output. It's not just a researcher sitting in a room or in an institution who goes out and makes it happen. So I think there's also a lot we've seen from these presentations about really making, uh, you know, making it less mysterious or mythical about how what what it takes to do good research, and to also do it in a way that the entire field is sort of involved, not just in, in, in sort of clarifying or establishing priorities, but also what questions we ask where and how. So I just wanted to also reflect that I think these are two things that I got very strongly from uh, these, these uh, examples. Um, Particularly, I think all of the presentations uh, spoke to ways in which the data and evidence are really being used to bring to attention very stark consequences uh, of neglecting children's very real experiences of violence in very difficult and different settings. And I was very struck, of course, Les, by your opening um, visual, because that's really the reality of it. We know we can talk data, we can talk so many things, but until we were able to confront the real impacts of this, you know, we don't maybe move the needle. And maybe even then we're not moving the needle. You talked about fatigue as well. And I think we, you know, it's a very real issue. Um, and you also talked about the difficulty of gathering data. How safe is it to actually even gather data in the midst of a conflict where we really should be there to spotlight and visibilize? But of course, it's also very hard. Um, but Ashley, I thought your example about uh, how the evidence really allowed us to not just provide that visibility to very complex issues of violence, uh, you know, wide scope and scale of violence that children experience, but that importance of building that common understanding and also capacities, because one of the things, of course, is that issues like violence are also very normative. You know, the perceptions about what do we count and what is shouldn't be counted because it's just normal. How do we confront and question all of that? You know, that's also a piece that research does. It, it, it kind of creates a frame that brings different people together to understand and agree 
on what's important. And those also have long-term policy consequences. They also shift and help us reframe understanding. And I think that's something that these examples that you presented were speaking to. Um, and then, of course, the other issue is this issue of an ecosystem, you know, because uh, the, the Together for Girls example talked to, showed very concretely what that ecosystem needs to look like. But I think we also heard from Leslie Les about how the ecosystem needs to sustain because, you know, it, in a moment you might be successful in the next moment, something changes and then you're not successful anymore in terms of the same issues which are actually worsening. So there are all of these sort of, you know, inconsistencies and contradictions, I think, that we need to really keep in, keep in mind. So I, I really want to um, congratulate and applaud all of you because I think this has really been very, very insightful and diverse uh, study, uh, you know, examples that you've shared. So I want to really turn to each of you perhaps in the first round of questions, um, uh, maybe just to get, go a little deeper into examples, and then we'll take a quick check in with the uh, with the Q and A. So, Ashley, you know, your example really also told us that what evidence does is it's not just the, what I was talking about the visibility and the establishment of scale and common understanding, but it's also about accountability. You know, your example about how the Kenyan government came back and, you know, it enhanced their accountability on what issues to focus on and how to, you know, sustain. Uh, it also was about the improving the effectiveness of investments, doing better with, with uh, learning to do better with our investments and measuring. Um, and I think the third is that whole issue of catalyzing change. And I really want to also uh, sort of recognize the point you made about going back. I mean, most research studies don't have that luxury of, or don't really build that in perhaps or foresee it as important, the, the issue of going back five years later, 10 years later, what did that research initiative generate? What is the change that it kind of influenced? So I really wanted to kind of recognize that. But research has all of these inbuilt potentials. Evidence does do that. So I just want to ask you, I mean, you talked about multi-stakeholder co coordination, et cetera, but is there something you can tell us more about how that trust in research and evidence was built? Uh, you know, what was what was the, some key ingredient in that environment that you created, um, you know, that was allowed that allowed you to sustain this? Because there's clearly some magic ingredients that really bring to life these 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 elements that you design uh, to make that. So is there something you can tell us which which you would like people to take away as a very important thing to do when you're designing and carrying out research, including with your donors? So maybe I can turn to you for two or three maybe a couple of minutes to tell us a little more. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you about donors and, and, you know, sustainability of VAX and how we've been able to continuously do this since the first VAX in 2007. I'm not sure the answer will be um, very satisfying in the end. I'll, I'll lead with the, with the final answer, which is that there are no future VAX planned after Tanzania, which finalized data collection this past summer in um, in June, July timeframe. So right now we don't have funding for any additional back. So we're in the same boat as, um, as all of you in this space. Uh, but prior to now, in 2007, uh, the government of then Swaziland, now Eswatini, um, came to UNICEF and said, we think we have a major problem with violence against children. Um, it's just specifically sexual violence against children in schools by their teachers. We need to do a national study to really dig into why this is happening. So UNICEF and the government of uh, then Swaziland came to the U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Together for Girls was birthed out of that. Um, in conducting a national survey, we found that it wasn't uh, that actually wasn't the biggest problem uh, related to violence against children or sexual violence against girls. Uh, much more prevalent was interim partner sexual violence against girls. Um, so the government of Eswatini put in many different uh, policies and programs to combat that issue, which was the most prevalent. And, and they actually have seen a decrease of 80% in um, sexual violence uh, against girls in Eswatini before age 18. Um, just having that information, realizing that our assumptions about what is really happening in the child protection or in this case specifically violence against children are not necessarily correct. We, you know, we know that uh, violence against children is an iceberg. We know that we only see the tip when we look at programmatic data, the data that are coming out, the data that people actually come forward with in going to the police, going to healthcare. It's just a very few cases. So we might think, we might assume that those are representative of what's actually under the surface, what's really going on. Um, but when we do really high quality data collections, these don't have to be necessarily national data collections, but when you do high quality data collections that 
protect, you know, privacy, confidentiality, and really look at what's actually going on, that may be different. And you might really need to change your programming. And I think the Together for Girls model, governments and others have seen that by actually looking at what's going on, it can inform um, real actionable change. So over the years, you know, it's just a snowball effect of countries coming um, forward to the Together for Girls partnership requesting um, surveys. Uh, you know, at a million dollars, they're not cheap. They're not things that can easily be absorbed into national budgets. So they have to be prioritized by donors. PEPFAR has been a big donor of the president's emergency plan for uh, AIDS relief in the United States has funded quite a number. USAID has funded quite a number. Um, unfortunately, uh, these national surveys are now under a lot of scrutiny. There is this idea across the board that we know what's going on. We know there's violence, um, but I would argue, you know, knowing how and why and what specifically we need to do about it can inform change. Um, so, but seeing the data, seeing other countries um, use these data and be committed and be held accountable and seeing that the change that happens, the national action plans makes governments really excited to look inward, look under the rug at what's going on in their own countries. Um, and and I, hope, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, I mean, I think you You've raised some more new questions as well, but I think it's very interesting to reflect on the fact that, you know, as you say, the, the country environment, you know, there was something that was happening that was getting countries to come up and ask these questions. And I think that's an incredibly important point is when the when the, who's asking the question, who wants to know? I think that's a really critical part. But I also think one of the things when we say, oh, there aren't any more VAC surveys, but I think the, the move to actually use some of the questions that were tested through the VAC surveys in other national surveys. I think I think you see that in some countries. To me, that's also an, an indicator of success. How do we adapt? How do we learn and adapt? So I think, you know, the VAC surveys uh, allowed us, you know, to, in a, you know, to experiment at a time when resources were available. So thank you for sharing that. And I um, just then want to well, move to the last topic. in, um, sorry, sorry, I, no, they're not over. We do hope there will be more funding. <laughs> yes, we can. While we wish for that, I think, but the adaptation to new new ways of continuing that work is also very interesting and important. And we shouldn't, you know, we should also celebrate that. Um, Les, just to say that, uh, you know, I, I think building on what Ashley's just said and also the comments you made, you know, you really talked very powerfully about the importance of political factors in determining uptake and use of research. You know, I, I mean, it was, I won't repeat what you said, but I think it was incredibly um, thought provoking and particularly what you do in terms of that, all those fatigues, as you said, media and donors and competing priorities, et cetera. But I just wondered if you have a reflection also based on what Ashley was saying about, you know, what what are we learning about new ways of doing research? So surveys, they have a moment, they take resources, and they're very impactful in many ways. But, you know, there's also the power of the stories that you talked about. Uh, and, you know, there's the need to adapt our research to new resource environments, to new ways of telling the story. So could I come back to you to say whether there's any reflection you have about how research can actually expand and go in different directions to continue uh, generating evidence, but perhaps in new ways, you know, to, to kind of come around some of these political things? Well, I think that... Um, you are absolutely right. A picture of a child washing up on a beach in Greece will induce more European support to Turkey for healthcare than all of the data collected by all of the scientists throughout the Syrian war crisis. So um, it's very hard to say what's going to sort of hit buttons and make the political machine align with the humanitarian agenda. Like it's just hard to predict that. When Maria was talking and taught, was sort of advocating for the no regrets approach, I was thinking something that uh, Ramya, you said, that is with most <clears throat> of the child protection things we do, the benefits will be seen 10 and 20 years later. With most of the nutrition and health things we do, the benefits will be seen 10 or 20 days later. And therefore, like the causal pathway of IRC being able to say, we cut mortal excess mortality in half, it cost you $200 per death averted, give us more money. Oh yes, the US government couldn't stop doing that. Like that just has such appeal. <laughs> and I was, I was just very, very struck by by what you said, Ramya, that you know, when I think about the 
really dramatic data that have made people's imagination understand long-term effects, it always involves following up on patients years later. For example, a brilliant Mozambican physician went out and did some surveys essentially about child survival during the war in Angola, uh, in Mozambique, pardon me, in Mozambique, and then followed up a few years later. And we found out that if a child had an attended birth, it would be less likely to die when it was three and four years old than a child who hadn't had an attended birth. Wow, did that just hyper energize the safe birthing community. And, you know, that was 25 years ago, but it, it just changed the whole game. And I think about my former colleague, Neil Boothby, mm -hmm. who worked on UNICEF's uh, child demobilization, child soldier demobilization program in Mozambique. And then when he was at Columbia years later, went back and followed up with those people who had been in his program. And he concluded that our program did harm, that these kids were no matter what, after being child soldiers, going to go through a brutal time to go back to their village where people had great anger at them and to have put them in camps for six months to sing Kumbaya and hold their hands and feel safer was not what they needed. They needed to get ready for a really hard go. And, and I just think that the child protection community hasn't done that stuff to show that child-friendly spaces keep children in school longer or have them graduate with higher rankings when they come to the end or allow mothers to work more and be less likely to uh, end up in an abusive marriage. Like there are, are tangible things we can get, but as, as you said, it takes sort of a long vision to help make a link that's strong and helps people's imagination understand that while wow, certain things are really needed, these other things, we don't have the data yet. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Les. I think that was really also very insightful. So much to unpack because obviously we, I think in the child protection field, there are also successful things we can say. And so the question for me, last question to Maria really is, Maria, do you, I mean, clearly there are very positive things we can do. But there is a question of the how long change takes. Mindsets have to change. People have to understand. You alluded also to the importance of donors, really also understanding that in some cases you have to be in there for the long term. And, you know, unfortunately, our cycles, political cycles, donor cycles don't really, um, you know, help with that. So do you have anything you'd like to see the research and evidence community do better given these realities? And I think we had a question in the Q&A also about, you know, how do we make this data accessible? So is there anything you would like us to think about? We have about maybe a couple minutes to, or two, three minutes to talk about that. Thank, over to you. Thank you. Um, no, and I think it, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I think it, it kind of ties into what Les was saying earlier. Uh, we do have data or we, ha we have some data on some things. Like I'm going to give a clear example, MHPSS and nutrition how the fact that if you conduct MHPSS interventions within the nutritional sites, you improve the nutritional outcome, right? Of, of both the child and because the, the caregiver is more relaxed, can actually take care of the child, important of caregiving and nutritional practices. So we have a lot of data, I think, on, this in, on these integrations of how child protection plays into other sectors, especially health and nutrition, I would say, are the two bigger ones, but we don't use it. We don't use it. I'm really sorry to say I don't have partners coming that are trying to sell an integrated approach that are saying I have, you know, like I did this, I don't know, three months and it gave me these results and now I'm going to follow up. But we don't have we always we continue to work in silos very much so. Um, and we also don't we are sometimes afraid to try out things. So, so we had a we had an interesting example from from us. Let's say we we initiated some work with our partners during the famine response in Somalia, where we integrated protection into health, nutrition, and camp management. And it was not let's boost protection services. Is how can protection actually help people gain access to nutrition, stay in nutrition programs? So making sure that parents don't have to make the horrible choice of leaving five children behind and the other one starves to death. All these things is what we need to be talking about in regards to child protection. 
as well. And this is what we're not seeing. Um, so I think this is important, but I think if I go back to what I was saying earlier, you need to work several tracks at the same time. Educating donors is a constant thing. You cannot come <laughs> when, 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 when things have gotten bad and try and think that you can actually convert a hardcore <laughs> food security guy <laughs> into thinking that funding children in armed conflict is a good idea. You know, this is something that needs to happen gradually all the time. It needs to be a conversation. And this is something that we, we often tell our partners, we tell the clusters, we tell everyone, come and talk. Like, like really, let's have, and it doesn't have to be a presentation. It doesn't have to be huge data, but we need to have like this constant engagement. So we also are educated. And so we also learn from each other. And I think this is, this is our plea to have this constant dialogue with the child protection actors. Thank you. Brilliant. And, and actually, you, you're you leading us very well to the wrapping up because it is about having those conversations. I was very struck by Les's example. We have to look at our failures. We have to look at our successes, but, you know, both with balance and we have to learn from them continuously and we have to share them and, and so on. So I think really thanks again to the Alliance for creating this space short and sweet as it was. Um, and hopefully this will lead to another dialogue on these issues because there were questions also about how you work with the media, for example, that we got in the Q&A, which we unfortunately couldn't get to because of time. But that is a big question is how do you, you know, these are, there are major powerful actors in play. And I think the point you were at mentioned, Maria, just now about integration and, you know, working across sectors and getting those. And I think there are good examples and maybe that's the next dialogue is how do we do research across sectors? So we're building in some of these questions into uh, other establishment, looking at those linkages. And I think these are all incredible ideas. I think there are examples of that out there, but obviously more to be done. So with that, I'm going to hand over back to you, Stephanie. I think it's you wrapping up. And thank you from my end to all of the, the, the panelists. I mean, it's been really interesting. Thank you so much, Rami, Les, Maria, and Ashley. Um, I think we could have kept this conversation going for quite some time. I feel like we just barely scratched the surface on the range of issues. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I think everyone who came here is interested in the both caring about data, but also how do we leverage that data and evidence to make an impact in what works? Um, and hopefully at a minimum, you've had some food for thought, but clearly we're not done and there is much more work to be done. Um, I wanna bring up our final slide, um, just three ways to keep this conversation going. So one, I'd encourage you to read the unprotected um, unfunded report that came out, you can scan it in your QR code that really lays a picture of what the need is. Why do we need to advocate? What's at stake here? Um, the second would be to join the mailing list for the Assessment, Measurement, and Evidence Working Group. Um, if you're not a member of the Alliance, you could also join the Alliance to join our working group, but at a minimum, join our mailing list so we can keep you up to date if there's things like this that come up. Third, because I've heard it never hurts to ask, if you are interested in funding something like that we've said that this data is lacking, that we actually have that robust evidence to show that this intervention has this impact, such as something called like a harms averted tool, if that's something even you're interested in exploring, you've had this idea. Also email us, let's talk more about it. Um, we are right at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much for coming. If you didn't catch all of this or if you have colleagues you wanna share this webinar with, we will make the recordings of all of these in all different languages um, live. And if we didn't have a chance to get to your question, please write it in the chat and I will follow up by email afterwards. These will be posted um, on the Alliance website and linked to. Uh, thank you again to our panelists and to our uh, co our web hosts at the Alliance for making this all run smoothly. Have a great rest of your day, evening, um, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Mm -hmm.